okay, everybody. I know we're all getting, everybody's getting a be, bit demob happy now. So um, we're up to, down to the final talk of the final session. So um, last, but by no means least, we have um, Laura and Freddie who are going to talk us about talk to us about scientific software in Rust. Who's going first? Me. <laughs> All right, hello world. Oh, where should I go? There. All right, welcome to our completely objective and thoroughly unbiased talk on our favorite programming language, Rust. Uh, I'm Freddie. Uh, and I'm Laura, and in a very recent past life, we were using Rust uh, to help with cancer research. Um, and we're gonna talk to you today about how you could be using Rust for your scientific software. So, if any of you have not heard of Rust, it's very similar to languages like C and C++ in that it's a compiled, strongly typed language. Um, but rather than being released 35 years ago, it was only released about 10 years ago. Uh, the, we haven't done a lot of practicing with a microphone, so like, bear with. <laughs> um, but the latest release was uh, just under a month ago, I think about 29 days, uh, and it is uh, completely open source. Uh, it's under active development. There's also a nightly release of the compiler. Um, called the nightly version. Um, Rust was originally developed by Mozilla Research and originally sponsored by, I think it was Mozilla, Google, Meta, Huawei, uh, and there's one I can't forget, but, you know, all the good guys. Uh, so in classic programming uh, way, we've started with a Hello Rust uh, little example for us all. Uh, it looks a lot like other C-like languages. Um, despite print functions being one of the first things that we ever used to learn, they are always a bit weird. Uh, this is no different. We've got an exclamation mark, uh, and that lets you know that it's a macro. Um, and yeah, sorry. Uh, and we've also got baby's first variable. Uh, so Rust is strongly typed, but it does have inference. So here we haven't had to say that X is an F64. Rust can infer it by the decimal point. Um, and also with the print function, you can have formatting like you do in Python. Uh, so the, uh, the reason Rust was developed was to try and be equivalent in performance to languages like C and C++, but to try and evolve past some of the pain points that those languages have uh, always had and are kind of fundamental. Um, so it tries to eliminate lots of different classes of bugs which are just inherent in languages like that. Um, so one class of bugs are things like um, implicit type conversions, which can be useful when developing programming languages quickly, uh, sorry, programs quickly, um, but can lead to unexpected errors in different places. Um, so here we have x, which is uh, a floating point variable, and n, which is an integer. Um, but Rust simply won't allow you to add those types implicitly together. Like you would have to explicitly convert one into the other type. Um, if you try and compile this program, you'll get an error that looks quite a lot like this. Um, it does look a lot like a, any other C style language. So uh, this is just a demonstration of some of the other syntax. We've got things like a for loop here. Um, and you can notice that um, you, you can also specify what type something would be. Um, so that's what the, semi uh, the semicolon in the U size does. Um, it also adds things like match patterns, which have recently made their way into Python. So these are really nice because they're quite fast, but they can also, as well as handling things like integers, you can do regex on strings. Um, and they're quite quick and much easier to read in some cases. So our experience with Rust was doing our PhDs together in Exeter. Uh, we were using Rust every day uh, to do cancer research. Um, and I was looking at how light interacts with breast tissue and biomarkers within breast tissue. And I was trying to improve how we can then uh, detect breast cancer from that. Cool. So Laura was using uh, light from a diagnostic point of view and I was using it from a treatment point of view. Um, but essentially, we, we needed to understand um, in detail the interaction between light and chemicals that were reacting and diffusing throughout the human body. Um, the obvious choice for uh, reaction diffusion is using the finite element method. Um, and if you want to understand how light behaves um, in any sort of system, you can either solve the equation of radiative transfer, and you can't do that. Um, but what you can do instead is use the Monte Carlo method, uh, which we'll look at in a second. Um, but both of these methods are numerical methods and essentially just have to do a lot of number crunching. Um, but thankfully, they're both embarrassingly paralyzable problems. Um, and therefore, a language like Rust, where you can do concurrency, um, is really useful. Um, so a Monte Carlo register transfer simulation, for any of you who haven't seen before, um, you, you build a statistical map of where light ends up through your system by just simulating the lives of billions and billions 
um, of photons. So here we have white light um, refracting through a prism in a, a foggy room, so you can see the light scattering back. Um, but sadly, the human body is not shaped like a prism, nor is it as easy to simulate as a prism. Uh, so here we have uh, an example cube of flesh, <laughs> where you can see also not the human body, but a little bit closer, <laughs> baby steps. Um, and you can, sorry, can you press play on this thing again? Um, yeah, so we've got an, uh, an input beam going in, and then the blue light being scattered, and then a reddish glow uh, to the other side. So you can see that the, we're managing to simulate how the light travels through that material. As we were spending all of our time developing codes that simulated how light traveled through a system, we thought it would be, uh, it would be criminal not to just try and make lots of pretty pictures. Um, so if you're usually running in a Monte Carlo register transfer simulation, you shine light out of the light source and you watch it bounce throughout a system. And then if you want to look at, if you want to get a picture out, you have to wait for the light to scatter into the camera, um, which isn't optimal. Um, but what you can do instead is a, a trick where you just reverse the simulation, you just fire photons backwards out of the camera and you see what they would observe. So here we've got a crab because it's a rustation. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, yeah. So we can just make lots of different pretty pictures basically. Um, so this is one of the rendering engines, rendering engines we built. Um, and basically this is just to give you an idea that we used Rust day in day out for about five years. So that's why we feel justified in talking about it here. Uh, so why did we pick Rust out of all of the options? So we are both astrophysicists by trade before we did our PhDs, and obviously astrophysicists love legacy code in Fortran, um, but we did not love legacy code in Fortran, and so we decided to, uh, well, Freddie started first by uh, developing the code in C initially. Uh, we moved to C++ for the sake of object orientation, just making the code a bit more uh, manageable. Um, but eventually, uh, Laura started a year after me, and suddenly I had to write code that not only worked on my machine, but worked on other people's. Uh, and therefore, we, we entered CMake Hell, which we spent more time um, developing the CMake script than we actually spent developing uh, the, the core library itself. And, and so what really attracted us to Rust in the first place was actually the ecosystem that comes along with it. Um, we'll talk more about the language in a second. Um, but to, to get the Rust compiler and the tool chain, it's just one curl command to just download it all. Um, you get the compiler, you get a package manager called Cargo, which works very similar to Poetry for Python, if any of you have used it. Um, and there's a, a, a public registry called Crates.io, which works very similar to PyPy. So anyone can upload their crate or, or download anyone else's from it um, with reliability. Um, it also is it's dependency heaven. It's really, really easy to just download and play with a library that's on uh, the registry, um, which is not only useful for scientific simulations where you need to you know, make sure that you get the same, um, the same library each time, um, but it also allows you to experiment with different libraries very quickly. Um, this is the uh, cargo.toml cargo file, which looks very similar to the pyproject.toml file. Um, and adding a new dependency is literally as simple as just adding um, the name in the version library and hitting recompile, um, and the package manager will handle it all for you, which was much nicer than uh, well, the CMake option. Uh, that's, that was the ecosystem. We'll talk a bit more about um, the actual features of the language itself. Uh, so the main thing that we needed our code to be able to do was run fast, because when you're simulating the lives of billions and billions of photons, you're waiting billions and billions of minutes to get those results out. So we needed it to be as fast as the C or the C++, because also, because we had those iterations, our supervisor would have been quite unimpressed if we rewrote it in Rust and then it took even longer. Um, the other good thing about Rust is the minimal runtime, so you don't need that much memory to get your code up and going. Uh, this makes it really good for um, embedded systems and things like that. Um, and particularly for us, the, the benefit of the language is things like zero cost abstraction. So we can, we can think of things as objects, but not worry about you know, the overhead of dealing with all of them. Um, it also, it drops variables and objects as they go out of scope, so there's no garbage collector. Um, and this is really useful because we don't have to pay the memory overhead of having garbage to begin with, nor running the garbage collector. Um, but it also makes our runtime profile um, very consistent between uh, simulations. Um, and that can be really useful for security reasons and also if you're developing for medical devices, you have consistent performance, which is also a big benefit for embedded systems uh, where you might have limited resources. Um, it's able to do this by being quite opinionated about its memory and ownership model. 
Um, so in, in any programming language, if you don't solve something concretely, then your abstraction layer just propagates it upwards and you end up getting bugs in your, uh, your higher level. Um, so in particular in computer science, you have the common problem of um, having shared access to a mutable variable. In Rust, you're simply not allowed to do that. You can have multiple references to a single immutable variable, or you can have one mutable reference to a variable. Um, so you have to think quite deeply about the construction of your program, but you know you, it, you can still share mutable access across threads. But you have to use a you have to use a mutex and a atomic reference count. Um, in C++, you could do it without doing that, but then you might end up into con in concurrency issues that you weren't expecting. Um, all of these things are enforced at compile time. So you're simply, the programming language does not allow um, concurrency bugs and things like that. Uh, yeah, so from the last slide about the garbage collection, it's automatically cleaning up after you, so out of scope, out of mind. Like, once, you're, once you've once you got rid of it, it's gone. Um, and also, it's, it moves semantics by default, so if you move an object into a function, then it's got complete ownership of that object. It's also quite opinionated about its type system. Um, so in C-like languages, you usually have um, public variables uh, by default, and they're usually uh, mutable by default. In Rust, it's the opposite, so you have to explicitly say that something is mutable or that something is uh, public, um, and that's kind of Rust in general. You have to be really explicit about what you're doing, and that makes it a lot longer to write, but you know, you, someone reading the source code, um, it's more obvious when a variable is meant to be mutated, et cetera. Um, it also makes changes, like there is no such thing as a null value in, uh, in Rust, so uh, I'm sure many of you will have heard the, the billion dollar mistake of having null variables in languages like C++. And you know, this, this is another class of bugs that are eliminated by Rust being really uh, opinionated about the things that you are and aren't allowed to do. So you don't run into dangling pointers in Rust because you can't have null pointers and you can't move around uh, pointers in general. Um, making comparisons to C++, you can do many of the similar things, but in a slightly different way. Um, so there's no such thing as templating in in Rust, but you can do something equivalent called generic types. Um, maybe if we have questions at the end, we can go into more detail. Um, there's also no such thing as inheritance. It has a concept of traits instead. Um, again, this kind of simplifies when you're looking at a class, you can see everything there rather than some details being hidden away somewhere else. Um, and it also handles things like polymorphism, but it does it with those match expressions that I showed earlier, um, which are both faster um, and more explicit. Uh, so as the half of the team that was more interested in how I can apply this to science and less about match patterns, uh, I was in, I like the fact um, of the libraries that you can download. Um, so for all of the like normal basic scientific needs, you've got linear algebra create and ND array create for the specialist topics. There's BLAS, there is an MPI create, um, which is less well used. Uh, and then there's Rayon, which does OpenMP. Um, there's deserialization. Uh, Rust can also handle um, most of the file formats that are used most commonly in scientifics, in scientifics, in science, um, like NetCDF and HDF5 and JSON5s as well. But wait, there's more. <laughs> You'd be absolutely insane to invent a, a, uh, a programming language and expect scientists to use it if you couldn't have direct interop with C and C++. Um, so that comes uh, as a native part of the language. Um, but there are also crates which extend it to interrupt with Python as well. So you can, you can quickly and easily convert between a Python and a Rust object, which is really quite nice. Um, it manages, it, it can do things like macros, which you can do in C++, um, but rather than it being part of the precompiler and it just injecting text, it actually handles it properly like a syntax tree, which means that when you write a macro, it behaves like the, the programmer expects it to behave rather than just uh, injecting stuff in. Um, there's also support for things for like GPU programming, um, again, through a crate, um, but it's really simple to just write a GLSL uh, kernel and use that almost like a function in Rust. Uh, the compiler is the best programmer, uh, the best pair programmer ever. It's kind of like having a senior RSC just embedded into your computer that's ready to go at all hours. Uh, it won't let you get away with shit, but it, it's, it will be quite specific about what it doesn't like. Um, and it does, I think it, it does lead you to become a better programmer because it won't let you bend the rules. You have to really think um, about the construction of your program 
um, from start to finish and very explicitly. Uh, it's also quite nice that you can um, you can do some uh, you can check your code without having to actually compile it. So um, you don't have to wait minutes and minutes to to see if that last change actually fixed your problem. Uh, it also has plugin support out the box, so you can add syntax extensions or linters really, really easily. Um, and a particularly nice one is this Flame Graph plugin. So you can just run your uh, you can run your program as usual with an additional command, and you get a nice graph um, describing where it spent all its time thinking. So all of it sounds really, really good. Um, so we do have a slide about bits that are less good, bad parts. Uh, as someone who came from more of a Fortran background, uh, I certainly struggled, and I don't think I'm alone from what I've read on the internet um, with uh, getting to grips with Rust. It's got quite a very, quite a very, very steep learning curve. Um, it's quite a high barrier to entry. It sort of forces you to learn everything about your code, even if you really don't want to, and it's not super necessary, but you will know how it works by the end. Um, and also, it's got a much smaller user base just because it's a newer language, obviously with the older and legacy codes, everyone's basically done everything already and will have been able to solve your problem quickly. And it can be quite difficult to find that support online or find examples of the specific little thing that you want it to do. Um, and then by that metric, it can take quite a long time to write anything. So uh, I used to be quite a fan of being like, oh, I'll just write like a little quick and dirty script and check that this is going to do what I think it's going to do. But there is absolutely no chance that I could have done that in Rust. Maybe you could have. <laughs> I couldn't. <laughs> And we'd say also, um, it's even if you knew the language inside out with omnipotence, it simply just takes a lot longer to write any program in Rust than any scripting language. I mean, that, that sounds obvious, but even more so than C++, you really have to get all of the memory model absolutely perfect before the program will even compile. So it takes just simply a lot longer to write. Um, not just machine learning, but that's the one that really stands out. There's, you know, for specific scientific applications, there just aren't libraries there that already exist um, within the Rust ecosystem. That being said, you'd be absolutely bonkers not to just use Python um, for machine learning. Um, and yeah, sorry, come back to that. Uh, so in conclusion, the way that I like to describe Rust is it's basically like C++, but you have super, uh, you have safety goggles glued to your head, and you're not allowed to take them off. Yeah, it does have good support for scientific research and like there are libraries that are available and as we showed it's so easy to just put them in your TOML file, take them out your TOML file, have a little play around. Yeah. Very easy to experiment with. Um, personally, I'd say Rust was very fun to learn and very satisfying to use. I would say it was less fun to learn, but still satisfying to use. <laughs> and, and basically, overall, it's, it's short-term pain for long-term gain. If you're working on a project and you've only got three months, you know, you, you, you're mental if you're trying to learn a new language to do that to begin with. Um, but if you have over a year and you've got the luxury of being able to learn a new programming language, um, if you are looking at the C sort of style family of languages, um, it's really worth considering Rust because, again, it it eliminates a whole class of bugs that you don't usually see until you're actually uh, running the applications. Um, it's, it's not suitable um, for fast-paced environments. Um, I now work in a commercial setting, and unfortunately, as much as I love Rust, um, there's no real reason to use it besides writing uh, high-performance kernels. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, got some of the questions up here. I think some of them you've already answered. So the top question there, I think you already told us what you didn't like about Rust, or which was different. Do you have anything to add up what you said, or are you happy with your answer so far? I liked it. Well, I am a bit biased, but I genuinely really like it. It's very satisfying to use. Like you, it forces you to build a program memory-wise correctly. Um, it can be it can be frustrating when. In C++, it allows you as the programmer to say, OK, I, I do know that this is correct, and therefore I can like move this pointer and there won't be consequences. Um, in Rust, you, you can't do that. Uh, well, OK, you can make an unsafe block and you can do it. So, um, I, I like Rust a lot. <laughs> I don't have anything. I did my own. Fine. And so uh, the, yeah, the, ne the, the next question, I guess, you also told us lots of real, lots of good reasons to choose Rust. Was the, is the one thing you'd pick? I mean, you've talked about the memory model. Is, is that it? Yeah, well, in our case, we were we needed very paralyzed code, and we needed, um, we, you know, just eliminating um, those sort of concurrency bugs. 
um, yeah, whilst more difficult to set the code up to begin with, um, yeah, yeah. You, you don't keep running into those issues again and again and again after you've got it right once. Um, and after you've built it once, if you make a modification to your code, the compiler will enforce uh, the correctness with that addition. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just, I guess, mostly the same. Like, it takes you a really long time to get it to work, but then when it works, you're like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that it's doing what I wanted because it wouldn't let me do anything else. Yeah, yeah, much more robust once you actually get it working. Okay, uh, so the next one up is, how did you sell Rust as a tool when there might be a concern over bus factor for maintainability, right? Because you, you, I guess you guys were the, the Rust experts and nobody else was. Uh, I'm not sure the bus factor is. Oh, hit by a bus. Yeah, oh. so how many developers have to be hit, hit by a bus before the project's dead? Okay, yeah, well, uh, one. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's and unless you have someone who's really into Rust, it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Don't get hit by a bus is probably the best <laughs> advice. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that 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 is a real concern, and therefore that's that is a real reason we wouldn't use it in production in a commercial setting at the moment, um, unless you had more than one person who understands it. <laughs> if you're not open to that. No, I think that's okay. I was suspecting the answer to this one might be a one word, one word thing. So shall we put on a Rust work, workshop at the next year's conference? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so you mentioned a bit in passing um, OpenMP and GPU use. I mean, can you say a bit more about that? It does, and you mentioned concurrency as well. So does the built-in concurrency support threading or do you have to use OpenMP? And with GPU, is it offload to CUDA kernels or are there other options for that for different accelerators? Um, in terms of, there is native threading library, uh, sorry, there is native threads as part of the standard library, um, but in our experience, there's a nice, there's a, there's a nice crate called Rayon, um, which behaves very similar to OpenMP and is really useful for parallelizing code, um, but you could do that with the standard library if you wanted to. Um, in terms of GPU acceleration, um, I've only messed around with it, with it a little bit, but that was almost equivalent to writing uh, CUDA co uh, kernels. You just, you write a kernel in something like GLSL and you compile it into a function and then you can call it as part of your, uh, you know, as part of the rest of the library. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, one, sorry, one last bit. Uh, oh, 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 yeah, sorry. I was just gonna say, if the, because of the strict memory model, how does it do the offloading of memory? How do you specify the transfer of memory from the RAM to the GPU memory then? Okay. Um, so it, it, it does impose all of these requirements, but you can add an unsafe block where you're allowed to you know, mess about with the memory a little more. Um, and that allows you to do, you know, do things like that. Um, but it's nice that if you do have a concurrency issue, then you only have to look within the unsafe bits of code. So you only have to look over 20 lines in your entire project rather than you know, throughout the entire thing. Um, and sorry, just one other thing. It also has support for MPI, and there's another crate that does that as well. Um, so yeah, I think quite nice for concurrency. I think we're reaching the end, but there's obviously a lot of interest, but, so we may get one or maybe two questions in. So how challenging was migrating the code from C++ to Rust? I'm gonna give Laura this one. <laughs> You're the one. <laughs> Um, I think Freddie had a really good time migrating the code from C++ to Rust, and I was sort of taken along for the ride. But it was less painful than I thought initially, especially because I'd come from Fortran, and then I was like, cool, got to learn C, and then I was like, cool, got to learn C++, and then I was like, please stop changing the language. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but we got there, and I think it was definitely worth it because then when it was running, it like it was going, and then when I needed to add on the bits specific to my project, I understood how everything worked. I knew where the bits I wanted to change needed to go, um, and also we didn't have any CMake files, so overall a win. <laughs> yeah. So I will just do this one last question, and it's a, a, probably too long to answer in like the minute we got left. But high development time seems like a fail. Uh, a, quite difficult for, maybe fatal for. For reset, should you instead be moving to things like DSLs and let the complex memory stuff be handled by actual computer scientists on the, under the hood? And I guess, what's the impact on that in terms of Rust programming as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Yeah, absolutely. In, in research, people often care about just getting results more than they care about the actual um, engineering of the code. Um, specifically with domain-specific languages, um, again, bias, but Rust does really nice um, macro support for those kinds of things. And again, it's handled as a syntax tree, so um, writing domain-specific languages is a lot easier in something like Rust than it might be um, just using pure macros in C. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I, there seems like there's a lot of interest here, So, but we are out of time. So can we please thank uh, Laura and Freddie and also the other speakers from this session. <laughs> <laughs>